here yeah. in July of 2024. It yeah. seems like things took a turn. Um, we, you know, had dramatic events. Uh, Donald Trump's attempted assassination. Same yeah. day, Elon Musk comes out with a strong endorsement for him on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Beth Jezos, Mark mm -hmm. Andreessen, Peter Thiel's obviously are, are already there. Um, so, you know, without getting political, because I do not want to make this show political, but just speaking about AI risk, um, mm -hmm. what happened the last week or two with AI risk and politics? Because it sure seems like the ground moved under our feet. Yeah, so they that they came up somehow with this um as part of their party as as part of their platform to get rid of all these ai um regulation so this and, is the gop uh, the national gop republican well, party platform it was it's, it's it's on their platform yes it absolutely is they want to take away all these guardrails that are already in place before all this happened and what they still don't realize is that ai is a bipartisan issue it's a very strong a excuse me. It's a very strong bipartisan issue. Yeah, and with the yet, public. yes, exactly. Yeah, and within two seconds, or not two seconds, but in, you know, very quickly, this be, all of a sudden became a partisan issue. Welcome to For Humanity, an AI Risk podcast, episode number 39. Did AI Risk just get partisan? I'm John Sherman, your host. Thank you so much for joining me. This is a show I have been hoping not to have to do, but here we are. AI Risk just got political in America. For Humanity is the AI Risk podcast for the general public. No tech background required. This show is solely about the threat of human extinction from artificial intelligence. Please share, like, subscribe, donate if you can. We need your support to build this community and spread AI risk awareness to the general public. Every like, every share, every subscribe, every dollar counts. Last week, we passed 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. Big deal. And we have already added more than 300 new subscribers since then. Let us keep this momentum going. Thank you. I appreciate your support. So for the 38 weeks we have been making this show, AI risk has remained pretty much nonpartisan in America. And polling generally shows 70 to 80 percent of Americans opposed to building a superintelligence that is far smarter than humans. This show will remain nonpartisan, and I will never let my personal political opinions loose here on anything other than AI risk, our sole focus. But if and when politicians choose to help us save our kids by regulating frontier AI, or if and when they choose to put our kids in far greater danger by accelerating frontier AI and opposing regulation, I will speak up about it here. To cover AI risk fully, talking about politics is unavoidable, but I will call it based purely on AI risk politics, nothing more general. Okay, so let's get to it. On Saturday, July 13th, former President Trump was nearly assassinated, and within a few hours, Elon Musk went on Twitter to fully endorse Trump and then Mark Andreessen followed, and before long, Beth Jezos and all of the accelerationist tech Twitter bros were on board for Trump. Peter Tr Thiel, Peter Thiel is, I'm sure, thrilled to welcome them, them all on board. He has been there for quite some time. Then, at the party convention a few days later, the GOP added removing all AI regulation as a priority in their 2024 party platform. And within just five days, AI risk regulation had become a partisan issue in America. At least at the top of the party, that's the way it is. I'm not so sure that the regular people on both sides are still not 70 to 80% opposed. We will see 
Can this issue avoid our tribal times and be bigger? I sure hope so. We will see. Then this weekend, Trump went to the Bitcoin conference and got cheers from all the tech bros there, further cementing this union. I think it's important to point out that in For Humanity, episode number 34, Charbel Raphael Sejeri points out that AI risk becoming a partisan political issue could actually be a good thing. Because right now, in his eyes, nobody really cares about these issues. And so having 50% of the population care a lot about it would be a good thing. 50% is way better than zero. But it looks like the first party organizing around AI risk is now, in America, the right on the side of acceleration and deregulation. That is a disappointing development. But if you are like me and you find that the big AI labs making tech that can end all life on earth, that they openly admit they cannot control and that they openly admit they do not understand how it works, if you think that is a thing we need to stop, there are lots of interesting positive things happening all over America right now at the state government level. Our guest this week is a guy I've been trying to get on this show for a while, Matthew Tabor. Matthew is the guy when it comes to knowing what is going on with AI regulation at the state and federal levels. He tracks every bill, and he knows his stuff up and down. As he will share, in California alone, there are nearly a half dozen bills in the state legislature, good AI bills, and they may well pass soon. It's encouraging. So here is my interview with Matthew Tabor. You are, as I look at the landscape of people in AI risk, you are the guy when it comes to legislative affairs um, in this country and what is going on with AI legislation all over the country. So just start out, Matthew, tell me a little bit about how you got involved in um, AI risk legislation, and then we're going to get all up into all the various states and what is happening in the states and California and everything, but just set it off by sort of what sets you down this path. Well, so I, I'm actually kind of, I'm actually kind of an amateur at this. I'm not a, a political policy wonk whatsoever. I'm actually a healthcare guy by training. I have a master's degree uh, in health services administration from the University of Evansville. Um, and I've been working in healthcare. Um, I'm actually 41, and I've been working in healthcare since I was 16. Um, but in 2007, uh, the economy <laughs> went down tubes, and that's when I was actually happened to graduate. So I went and uh, got got dragged up to Washington D.C. to work on policy. Um, and so I worked for a member of the House, and I worked for um, the uh, the health. Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee uh, out of the United States Senate um, in 2008 as an intern. I did two congressional internships in the Congress, uh, and that and those were the two that I did. Um, I came back to Nashville shortly after that time in Congress. Um, I I then got into politics a little further um, in 2016. Um, I wanted to bring um, a new primary care law to the state of Tennessee, which is where I'm from. I wanted to um, bring a new primary care law that would protect primary care a little better uh, and enhance it a little greater in the state of Tennessee in 2016. So um, by by April of that year, I had a little baby law, and so uh, it was uh, it was a primary care law signed by Governor Haslund uh, in April of that year. And then after that, I, uh, I I gave up politics. I gave up politics for Lent, and I I really didn't look back um, on it. I got back into my healthcare stuff and really didn't care less about politics after that. Uh, I got drafted back into the game though back in uh, late last year. Um, I have some friends who were a part of an organization that were uh, on strike for 118 days last year. Um, and yeah. 
they were on strike for 118 days last year because of AI. They, yeah. This this was something that they were worried about that wasn't to come in there um, and completely uh, yeah. destroy destroy their livelihood, which they're absolutely correct. And, that's and this is the actors, right? This is the this, this is uh, this is this is the Hollywood protest. This was, and I I'd actually have done some background work before, so I was a little familiar with uh, with with a lot of them. I'd done uh, background work on our TV show Nashville. And so I did background on five out of the six seasons that Nashville was here, um, when I was here in Nashville filming. And so I was a little familiar with what it was that they were talking about. And so I kind of got drafted in by several actors that I know um, who were deeply concerned about the threat that AI causes. And so I jumped in with them to... To, to to help them out with the and sure, so, and this is last year. So Matthew, yeah. tell me, what was your what was your footing on AI before this? Before the actors' strike? Before the you know you were sort of drafted into service uh, for this? Yeah. What were you thinking about AI? Were you thinking about it at all? I wasn't really thinking about it at all. The only thing that I was thinking about with AI was uh, was really my my good pal Siri. <laughs> Other than that. That's really all I was really thinking about at the time. Yeah, I knew though that um, what AI was about to do, I was very worried about what it's going to do, and I'm still worried about what it's going to do to healthcare. I don't think it, it's going to make healthcare better. I think it's going to make it a lot worse um, because wow. AI can be easily manipulated. You can get it to say it whatever you want to say, and I think when you mix that with healthcare, I think that's extremely dangerous. Okay, all right, that's because we, we, away, we can. Yeah, yeah, you because you're taking away the good human brain, the human intelligence of that. You're taking that away by getting AI involved, and so that's going to be that's going to be tricky. But that, but really, what I saw in this, and what I was really brought in um, by some of the actors to help them out with, was to help them really to kind of track more of this. That's kind of one of my forte is being able to track track legislation but also not just being able to track legislation you know it's one thing to track it but it's like what do you do with it and so helping them also to get in front of congress help them get in front of their state legislatures and how yeah. to help them get in front of um the right people to help get legislation that they want out there and so sure. that's really what i did and i started out with a great one helping them out with a bill here in tennessee excellent okay so um let's get into the tennessee bill and then we'll yeah. go from there into all the other bills. And I sort of want you to, if maybe just at the top here, talk about the moment we're in where, you know, you get involved with this end of last year. We come into this year. Um, obviously, you know, things are moving incredibly quickly. And and this moment where in in many states, laws are being drafted. Lobbying right. is happening. You know, the, right. there's sort of a field and it is blooming with flowers of of legislation that is being drafted all over the country. Right. Well, so so there's been earlier this year a lot of action when it comes to at the state level. Congress hasn't done anything. Right. They, they've introduced a lot of stuff, but they haven't done squat. Um, a lot of the states have said, oh, forget that. We're going we're gonna to continue to just move on uh, and do it our way. <laughs> to, to quote that song, I will going to do it our way. And, uh, and yes, they, they have done it their way. Um, yeah. Elvis in Tennessee was the first one out of the starting gate this this year. Elvis yeah. is a law uh, here in the state of Tennessee. Um, yeah, who knew that Elvis actually is an acronym? Who knew? Right. What Elvis, does it stand for? You might you you got to know all those letters. Yeah. So Elvis is Elvis is an actual acronym. Elvis is the Ensuring Lightness, oh. Voice, and Image Security Act of 2024. Very so, so Elvis is an acronym, and so. That was so. What he does is he amends our Tennessee um, right to privacy. I'm uh, sorry, I read the publicity law. We have a right to uh, publicity law. We're one of about oh 13 or 14 states in the country that have what are called right of publicity laws, and so we have one. It's been on, on the books since 1984, and so here in Tennessee because of the way that we are with music, you would think that you would want to protect your voice. However, in, in 1984, nope. <laughs> and they didn't do that with our, with, believe it or not, with our publicity law back then. They didn't put voice in there. Um, that's what Elvis does. Elvis actually goes in there now 
and updates um, our right of publicity and law uh, by bringing it up to date in the century. And so sure. he Elvis specifically does that by protecting your your actual image, your likeness, and your voice. He does all three things. So um, uh, there's so yeah. much to love about this thing, right? First of all, it's it's uh, so sort of like iconic and memorable Tennessee Elvis voice likeness, yeah. like all of these very um, approachable things. And this thing was so approachable that it was passed unanimously and signed by the governor, right? Is that is yeah. that where where it's at? And and yeah. so talk about that because there's nothing in America that gets passed unanimously, it no. seems anymore. How did the Democrats and Republicans come together to vote unanimously for this AI regulation? Yeah. So so yeah, so okay, so Elvis again. Uh, Elvis was born into law March uh, March 21st of this year. I witnessed him being signed into law by my own two beautiful brown eyes. So Elvis actually went into effect officially July 1st. And so okay. he is now the law of the land as of July 1st. Um, but it took a lot to get him to that point. In the long run, he was passed unanimously. Um, Tennessee, from time to time, uh, will pass bills um, unanimous, unanimously. They do it. They do it once in a blue moon, but it's po but they will do it. Uh, with Elvis, how they really came to pass it unanimously is they knew what would happen if they didn't. So first of all, the music industry and the entertainment this world were definitely behind Elvis for sure. They led the effort into getting Elvis passed. However, Elvis is not a music bill. He's not an entertainment bill, period. Right. If you don't look into Elvis actually you will not find those words in the bill, period. Elvis is just protecting everybody's image, likeness, and voice. He is for everybody here in the state of Tennessee. That's what he is doing. So who in their right mind would want to be against that? The bottom line, what brought, what I honestly think what brought everybody together is they knew what would happen if they did not. They knew it's so and they did not want to be on the wrong side of history. They know that right. AFE can be the ultimate job killer, and they did not want to be on the wrong side of history of that. And what does it really do in terms of name, image, likeness, per, you know, the, the voice likeness protection? Um, you know, does it mean if I am a, I don't know, I'm a voiceover artist in Nashville, um, how am I protected differently than a voiceover artist in Maryland? Yeah, because it, it, it's it's because it's being able to protect you because you're here in the state of Tennessee. It's protecting because it's specific to us is what it's doing, and it's protecting your voice from being deep fake and your right. image and your from being deep fake. But it's all so applicable to Tennessee. Only applicable to Tennessee. Wow, it's so narrow. Yeah, so I'm because, just thinking because you know state, because he's a state law because it's a state law. Right, right. Super, super interesting. Okay, but so country does not have an Elvis law. They right. but this this country doesn't, and Congress needs one. And so a lot of people keep on thinking that maybe Elvis is, you know, a good can be a good framework for a for a uh, federal bill. Okay. And, and, okay. All right. So um, around the same time Elvis is coming up, there are other things coming up in other legislatures, um, not the least of which is California and Senate Bill 1047, yeah. which is, uh, yeah. you know, obviously getting a lot of uh, heat, a lot of conversation. Um, talk to me about that time period when other states are saying what's going on in Tennessee, we should get something going. And, and you know, yeah. how does it work? Like, how does one state decide we're going to make a bill and yeah. some state says we're not and. Yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly, you know, what drives them to do certain stuff and what drives them not to do certain stuff. But there are other, there have been other states who have been very um, active when it comes to passing um, or at least getting bills out there this year. Uh, it's, I would say California by far is the most active. But we, I've seen some action out of Alabama. I've seen stuff out of Mississippi. I've seen stuff out of Florida, um, Hawaii, um, Illinois, Kentucky, um, New York. New York has had some action going through. I know New York is currently working to pass about three different bills, and I'm keeping an eye out on out of New York right now. 
Um, and so, and there's, there's, there's some action in other states. Right now, the state that is in the most active period is California. Um, they actually are on a one month um, hiatus right now. They're coming back as of August 5th. When they come back into the session August 5th, they will have a large hearing in their um, Committee on Appropriations where multiple uh, AI bills that I'm tracking will have hearings. Um, and so SB 1047 is has been referred to that committee. It hasn't. It doesn't. It doesn't have a date with Destiny yet. But I think they're they'll probably work on getting that um, as soon as possible. Uh, okay. So, so Tell me about the bills. Like, what are the what are the bills in California? What are, what are they trying to do? Like, what would you know? What what would these various bills do? Yeah. So there's 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 multiple bills that I have. First of all, there's hundreds of bills that are out there. Um, I'm what I'm doing is I'm keeping track of bills. Um, I have I have a legislative tracker. Um, there are about thirty bills that I'm watching across the country, including in Congress. Um, and those bills are specific to putting guardrails on AI. Um, that's what Elvis did. He put he put guardrails out there. Um, and so there are five bills uh, in California specifically that I'm looking at. Uh, one is called AB 2602. Um, that has to deal with um, with digital replicas and trying to trying to stop that. Basically, um, there's okay. another one called AB 1836. Uh, it's another digital replicas uh, bill as well. Um, there is one called SB 1047. So what what people don't necessarily know about that one is that that bill is actually modeled off of the White House 2023 executive order, which establishes a set of requirements for developers of covered models that apply before a model is actually trained. So that's what, so SB 1047 is modeled off of the executive order. Uh, And then AB 1831 uh, that's a really good one. That's a very important one. That one helps to prevent sexual exploitation of children um, from AI. Um, and so that's a very important bill um, wow. that is going through California. And in AB 3211, that's another big one. So this one actually requires social media companies to label digital media created by gener- generative AI images as fakes. Hmm. So it, wow. that's, a, that's a big one there. It's it's called it's a it's a provenance and authenticity and watermarking standards bill, is what that is. Um, and so, and what is the climate out there in California? Are there um, you know is the legislature just filled with zillion dollar lobbyists from all the big companies that are yeah. trying to get all this stuff killed? Yeah, they are. And luckily for me, I know how to track that. I track there's. So each state, you can actually find that out, what lobbyists are actually trying to kill, what bills. Um, There's uh, each state through their secretary of state's office um, has a database, uh, basically where all the, where all the registered lobbyists are, lobbyists are, and you can see what they're actually are, are paying the members. Um, you know, how they're influencing these members, wow. what they're actually, what bills are actually lobbying on. Um, so that's at the state level. At the congressional level, there's one called opensecrets.org. Yep. And so you can see what members of Congress, <laughs> they've already basically paid off um, and what committees they paid off as well, what committees are lobbying, um, what they've already spent on lobbying and what bills that they are actually specifically going at yeah. to try to kill. So um, you can you can see that as well. You so like, as well. you know, from like a base level, right? The way that like large language models work is they take a whole bunch of text and images, yeah. videos from the internet, and from that creates this new thing that is grown from it. It seems to me that a lot of the, Legal work, legislative work, a lot of the ability, the chances to stop this thing come from picking apart that soup 
that started it off and trying to attribute who owns what and trying to really figure out what they had the right to train on and what they didn't because it sort of seems like it's just a whole dumpster full of shit and some of it they bought some of it they got licensed for and some of it fell off a tree some of it fell off a truck like yeah. uh you know doesn't it, it seems sketchy as hell like what yeah. is in the training suit yeah i i i don't know um I can tell you that the large language models do nothing but violate law. They, they violate so many different laws. I've lost track of what laws they violate because I've, I've lost, I just say I've lost count is what I meant to say. I've lost count of how many laws they violate because they violate so many laws. It's not funny. Um, all this, all this information out there was basically stolen from the get go. Uh, when they created these models, um, which royally ticked off Hollywood, which royally ticked off the music industry, which royally took out the, ticked off the publishing industry, and yeah. also the media, the news media itself. They had all yeah. this stuff stolen from them, and that's what yeah. they use to train off of. And they also have medical data that they have stolen as well. It's sort of like the original sin of artificial intelligence. Like um, it is, it, it it is born from a stolen seed or something. Um, it is. Do you believe that could be its undoing in the end? Is it possible that that could get all the sh stuff smushed back in the can if they said it's, you know, it's fruit of a rotten tree, you can't have any of it? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. That's why we need guardrails, you know, uh, so badly. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very disturbing what's going on. It's clear that, that these these so-called tech companies who are doing all this had never heard of the word law before. That's obviously that's obvious. Because had, you know, OpenAI heard of what's called law, I don't think they would be doing what they're doing. But that's obvious that they haven't. And even Scarlett herself proved that by what what happened to Scarlett. She proved that they've never heard of the word law before. Is it possible that the law can catch up with this thing that is moving so fast it seems like no one can it even can. put their hands on it it can tell me it about can't. how, how can something ready. moving yeah yeah there's always so first of all we know that congress is not going to do anything uh okay. a certain party which i which will remain nameless came out recently with their platform saying they will get rid of all ai regulation including elvis they will get rid of elvis for sure um, so, but little do they know that there's already, um, multiple laws on the books that are very, very strong that they can still use, um, that people can still use to their advantage. There's also two major, major government, government, uh, organizations, um, that can go after this as well. So on the law side, what's really strong is right of publicity. That is a very strong law that people can um, that people can use. Um, it's actually why Scarlet has a case in the first place against a open AI is because of right of publicity. And so that's that's that that's a major thing there too. Um, and when it comes to the government entities that I mentioned who can be really strong on this, uh, in fact, they already are very strong on this with enforcement um, and going after this. Uh, it's called the Department of Justice and the FTC, the, the Federal Trade Commission. Both organizations actually already have very, very active um, investigations into multiple um, major AI companies, including OpenAI, um, for, um, for basically... Uh, for, for all these sins, basically, they have, um, they're basically going after them for um, monopoly being uh, for for that stuff too. And I'm trying to have a better word for it. Um, um, uh, antitrust is actually the better word that I was looking for there. I apologize. Yeah. Antitrust is what they're actually all being investigated right now for. And could you, I was stunned when I first read the New York Times OpenAI lawsuit, the remedy they're seeking is literally the destruction of the AI model. 
that is what they're asking for as the remedy uh, on on all these things. Yeah. Let's just say the courts say, yes, you're right. Uh, original sin, all this stuff is stolen, but this train is moving a thousand miles an hour down the track. Right. Um, what happens then? Yeah, I don't know. But I think that's why you have the Justice Department doing what they're doing. And I think, I think, I think again, they'll continue to go after it. Yeah. I think um, in the long run, justice will prevail. So I, I, you mentioned a political thing that happened, and I have tried for 38 weeks now, 39 weeks, to stay away from politics in any way, uh, to try to keep AI risk away from politics in any way. And here yeah. in July of 2024, it yeah. seems like things took a turn. Um, we you know, had dramatic events, uh, Donald Trump's attempted assassination, same yeah. day, Elon Musk comes out with a strong endorsement for him on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Beth Jezos, Mark mm -hmm. Andreessen, Peter Thiel is obviously are, are already there. Um, so, you know, without getting political, because I do not want to make this show political, but just speaking about AI risk, um, mm -hmm. what happened the last week or two with AI risk and politics? Because it sure seems like the ground moved under our feet. Yeah, so they... That they came up somehow with this um, as part of their party, as as part of their platform to get rid of all these AI um, regulation. So this and, is the GOP, uh, the National GOP Republican well, Party platform. It was. It's it's on their platform. Yes, it absolutely is. They want to take away all these guardrails that are already in place. And so Elvis, yeah, they would get rid of Elvis very quickly. But here's the thing is that before all this happened, and what they still don't realize, is that AI is a bipartisan issue. It's a very strong, a, a, excuse me, it's a very strong bipartisan issue. Yeah, and with yet, the public. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And within two seconds, or not two seconds, but in, in, you know, very quickly, this be, all of a sudden became a partisan issue. I know. And so, uh. and so yeah. So our governor here in the state of Tennessee, our governor, our, our legislature is GOP controlled. Um, Elvis was passed unanimously, unanimously. Our governor mentioned Elvis in his state of state address. Elvis, um, Elvis was one of his signature bills that he wanted to get um, passed into law. And now, and now will he? Re he he is saying not just the national GOP. The governor himself is saying he hasn't come out. He hasn't come out publicly saying that. But if you're a member, if if you're with your party, you do what your party says. That's how politics works. Yeah. And so that's what we're doing here in Tennessee is putting the two together, saying, yeah, he's gonna go. He's gonna take out Elvis. If that's what his party wants, that that's what will happen. Wow. And I don't feel so we are very tribal in America with our politics these days more than ever at any point in my life. I don't feel like AI, you know, risk, concern or enthusiasm has reached the sort of like general citizen level yet. Like it's in the GOP platform, but I don't think right. the average GOP voter is like we need to repeal all the AI laws. Um, no, no. Right. Each, no, I don't. You know, I haven't heard a lot of people saying that actually. But right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I imagine, if you ask the average voter, Republican, is that in your platform? They would not be unaware of it. It seems like something right. you know at a more subtle level. Um, yes. What yes. are your thoughts about as the regular people start to figure out this is what the party's trying to do? You know, polling is seventy, eighty percent. Everybody wants to regulate AI and not make something smarter than us that could kill us that we don't understand or, uh, you know, right. how it works or how to control it. Um, right. Do you think they'd be able to make this like a citizen level tribal issue in America today? I'm not so sure. I don't know. But I think, I think once it gets the word out that this is what is, is being tried, is being... Uh, people they want to see happen. I think people will be will will try to fight this. In fact, I'm actually working with some with some people to get the word out that there is a possibility that Elvis could be repealed. And so I'm right. looking at 
I'm working with them um, behind the scenes to come up with a plan to make sure that doesn't happen. Something I think in your Elvis. This this should actually happen. happen. Yeah. Something in your Elvis fight that I think is a really important detail is you had moneyed interests on your side, right? So like you had the music industry. Yes. If, if, um, parties concerned with AI risk could figure out how to get other moneyed in- industries and interests onto their team. Yeah. That could be really important because it, it, it seems like an unfair fight if it's Microsoft and Google it, versus pause AI. It absolutely is. Here's something else that I think also, if I can go backwards, here's what I, cause you talked about earlier about there was a shift all of a sudden, this yeah. was a bipartisan issue that took a shift, dramatic shift, uh, partisan. What I think what happened, and I've heard rumors that, that, that this happened, there were a lot of people actually frustrated with the bills out of California, such as Meta, and they were all, Meta and some of the bigger ones in OpenAI were upset uh, with uh, with SB 1047. And, yeah. and, and like Y Combinator came out and some others, like they even put out a website trying to stop 1047. Yeah. And, and they got frustrated with this. I think they can see the right on the wall that that all these bills that I mentioned earlier actually have bipartisan support in the state of in the state of California. Um, so they're you know they're they're passing the committees they need to pass. Those bills are doing very very well. They're going to move regardless, I think. And so I think they can see the I think they saw that right on the wall. So I think that's what happened is that they use their contacts to get the JD bands. And then they use their contacts to get the President Trump, and they use those contacts to get into the platform. Um, yeah. To get them to roll back the regulations because they see they see that as stifling innovation. And right. what the goal is of a lot of these bills that are coming out, especially the bills out of the Cal- out of California, the goal is to not stifle uh, um innovation at all in fact sb 1047 doesn't do that at all (laughs) it doesn't it helps innovation um and so all these bills are doing is they're not stifling innovation they're just uh they're just putting guardrails out there and because what they want to prevent are all these are all these ridiculous amount of lawsuits that you will see if you don't have these kind of regulations in place yeah well, you know, note to them, innovation becomes very challenging if we're all dead. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> just a yeah. small little note. Um, so Elon Musk says if 1047 passes in California, that tech is mm-hmm. dead in California and all those jobs are going to leave for Texas and there'll never be any more tech in California ever again. Is that true? I highly doubt that. Yeah. What do you uh, think it would really I, do? Like, if it if it, it appears set to pass, what happens then? I, I think. Well, I think people are just overreacting to it. Um, that's that's the other thing too. Is that everything gets everybody gets on their one side and tries to spin everything. They'll take stuff out of context all the time, and it'll make it worse than it actually is. Um, Ten forty seven. It's it, it, they're all worried about nothing, in my opinion. Is it a good bill? Is it is it it's worth the, worth the fight? It's a very good bill. It's a phenomenal bill. Um, it's a really good one. AB thirty two eleven is uh, AB twenty six zero two, AB eighteen thirty six, and AB eighteen thirty eleven are are eighteen thirty one. Excuse me, are just all amazing bills. And I'm jealous that they're in California, <laughs> not Tennessee, because uh, they're 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 phenomenal. They will be phenomenal bills for that state. Okay. No, what it, does it, it do? It, like, what, that, what happens? No, it, it it's yeah. it's going to help, but it's going to help because it's going to help put more some really good guardrails out there too. What is what these companies okay. don't like? They don't like guardrails because it 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 takes away their profit that they can make. Yeah, and so uh, for safety reason, for safety and for safety and risk, yeah, these guardrails. I admit they will hurt their profit, but this is what we need in order to survive and to protect us as the human race. Yeah. And that's what 1047 does and all the other bills that I mentioned. They put in great guardrails to help AI risk, to help AI safety. What percentage 
of state lawmakers in America do you believe realistically understand AI risk? I would say a very teeny tiny small amount. I actually did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I would say not many um, do it all, I would say. And yet they're all voting on these bills. Like it, it right. it's it's a it's a weird period of time. And about I get it. Right. Like, you know, I'm in business meetings all the time with business people who are like not even paying attention. And you know, like yeah. like it's it's just this thing everybody hears coming, coming, the train's coming over your shoulder, but not many people yeah. are turning around to face it. No. Um right. I I I I mean it seems crazy voting on bills you don't understand the fundamental like, you know science of or the fundamental like systems behind um right yeah i i i I guess uh what can people do about it you write your you send in a letter you make a phone call you the old-fashioned way you have to you have to keep on educating them in fact that's what i was doing or earlier this year with several um members of the organization that i was helping to track legislation for um, is that's exactly what I told him. I said, you want to, um, you want to write letters. You want to call them, uh, the members and you want to call Ashley, most imp- the most important people in there. It's the actual staff. The staff is the ones who actually do the dirty work. The staff is actually the ones who write the bills. So the staff are the ones that you want. The staff is the ones that you really want to um, pay attention to the most and talk to the most because they have the ear of the person that they work for and they yeah. can definitely get in legislation um, that you want in there. Um, in fact, that's what I was telling several of the, the other members that I was working with earlier this year is that you have a real opportunity here. If you want to put in actual word into Elvis, you can do that. You can actually put in actual language that you want to see in these bills. Wow. And do you um, do you sort of lobby? Do you do you call offices and try to, you know, move the ball? Or are you just sort of tracking all this stuff? Are you in an advocacy position? I'm I'm I help. I help in all those ways. I, I do it actually more nowadays um, since I really gave politics up for the lint. I really. <laughs> I really do it more in an educational um, capacity more than I do it in a active capacity. Um, so I, 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 I'm more likely, I actually, I'm sorry, I mainly just teach people on how to do this the correct way. There's a wrong way and there's a right way to do it. And, I'm, and I obviously teach them the right way to do that in regards to how you speak to the, to the staffers how you speak to the members um okay about, about doing this because it's a fight um off. i believe it this okay. is kind of crazy and we haven't we haven't pre-planned this at all would you do a little role play with me right now and i'll be a, a I'll, I'll be a congressional uh office uh operator i'll be the staffer i'll pick up and you'll be you'll, you'll be on the phone call and you'll just give us a little demonstration of how sure. you would call an office all right sure. here i'll yeah. even i'll put on my glasses for this matthew I'm now not playing myself. I'm playing the role of uh, a congressional person. Uh, hello, Congressman uh, Johnson's office. How can I help you? Hi, yes. I would like to speak to the legislative assistant who handles uh, AI policy. Okay, hold on one second. Hey, uh, this is the legislative assistant who handles AI policy. And your name is? How can I help? Uh, my name is uh, Bill Stevens. Hi, Bill. My name is Matthew. I uh, just wanted to say I... Uh, appreciate the work that the congressman is doing. Um, I appreciate um, he, he's fighting hard for his constituents. And I really appreciate it. Um, the congressman, I know that he wants to be on the cutting edge of stuff. And I was wanting him to be aware of uh, these threats that we have in the country right now in regards to AI. Um, we okay. are having um, AI actually... Um, come in and some pay in some cases deep fake people. Um, they're creating deep fake porn like what we saw of Taylor Swift. Um, they're creating 
um, deep fakes of people's voices, like what we saw with with um, Scarlett Johansson and other people um, earlier this yes. year. Um, we here in the state of Tennessee um, actually passed our own little legislation earlier this year called Elvis. Uh, Elvis is called the Ensuring Likeness, Voice, and Image Security Act. And what Elvis does is he actually uh, helps to protect your image and your voice from being deep fake. And would love to see um, a federal version of Elvis um, be done um, at, at uh, within the federal level to be passed. All right. Well, uh, you know, I'll uh, I'll be sure to uh, go, I'll probably give your comments to the congressperson. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I like it. So what I liked to now I'm, I'll be back to myself. What I liked about it to you is you came in very much on the ground floor with not X risk, not um, things that seem. You came in with things that seem practically legislatable. Deep fakes, porn, you know, job stuff, like all that stuff um, seems like things that elected leaders would want to say they are addressing. Yes. As opposed to that's, as giant. That's exactly, that's exactly how you do it. You want to go in there, you want to let, let them be aware of an issue that's going on. And then you want to go in there and say, hey, um, there's already been some successful legislation on this. It would be phenomenal to see this at a more of the federal level here. Um, and and you have, in this case, you know, a great example being Elvis, um, being a good framework for that. You also have a really ridiculously amazing, strong right of publicity bill out of the state of California that can really be also... Um, that framework for a congressional bill as well. Right. And, you know, for people like me who are very concerned about existential risk from AI, um, it is it is a little bit of a realization, a slight disappointment, but then it's also slightly exciting to think about maybe traditional laws that don't go for X risk, but just chop at the bottom of the tree. We're just, you know, chopping away at it, trying to make it grow slower. Um yeah can work and maybe that yeah. is the winning strategy is like let's yeah. let's cut it off at every pass you don't go yeah. for one headshot you it's a death of a million cuts yes that's and and and, and, I'll, and i'll and i'll kind of prove that too so the whole scarlet situation too people are like oh there is no way she has a case well that just shows that they don't know law of course she has a case she has a major case how she has a major case is because that voice was meant to be a sound alike. Now, if Mr. Altman knew what law was, he would know that sound alikes are illegal in right of publicity laws. They're protected. That's how she has a case. And so Scarlett doesn't have to go to Congress and use that kind of a congressional bill that's already out there. Nope. She uses the great state of California's bill. And yeah. she also has legal precedents on her side, known as common law. And there's a phenomenal bill out, a phenomenal case, I should say, excuse me, called common law. That case out of California was done none other by Bette Midler, called Midler versus Ford Motor Company. It was a very similar situation to what happened to Bette Midler. And okay. so Midler won her case against Ford Motor. And so that becomes common law because it happened out of because the, because the case was heard out of California. The case had the case uh, was ruled in her favor out of California. So Scarlett has this case because of that case. Wow. And so yeah, wow. so you can already use again cases like that. So common law, legal precedents, and you can already you can already use laws that are already in existence here. I have a dream, Matthew, that all the movie stars and all the singers, musicians, and maybe some other artists as well, are going to all get together and be the most public opposition to artificial intelligence. 
Um, I feel like if you could take that coalition, bind them to all the religious people on earth who don't want to see a sand god, and there you all of a sudden have the most popular, most listened to, most numerous set of people on the earth vocal in opposition to frontier AI development. Yes. What stands between us today and my grand vision of the celebrity army taking on AI? Nothing. They're all ready to go right now. I can't say publicly, but I know they are. I can't give more details on that, but they are. They are all working to come together um, to do that. Now that the word is out that that a certain group turned a major bipartisan issue into a partisan issue, yeah, they they want to fix that. Wow. And I mean, that does fall on traditional fault lines, right? The sort of uh, left Hollywood um, group organizing. Uh, are they, is Hollywood concerned with anything greater than job loss? Like, do you think in these stars, movie stars that are starting to learn about these issues is X risk, the fact that the people who make Frontier AI say that they don't understand how it works, they can't control it, and it could kill us all. Do the celebrities know that? I, I think they do, but let me back up. I know that as a fan. I know that as a as as a fan. I'll I'll prove a, I'll prove that too. The the whole AI thing bothers me as an actual fan. Um it it, it really does. Um because now when I go watch at movies, which I do, I go see movies at least once or twice a week. Uh, now because of AI, I'm not going to be able to tell what's real, what's not. Yeah. I, I'm not going to be able to tell. Unless it's a sci-fi movie, then obviously that's a totally different story. Yeah. But I'm not going to know from here on out what's real, what's not. In other words, like, for example, late last year, uh, I went and saw um the um the marvels late last year and so uh, i saw that movie came out of that movie uh with a friend and we're talking with it talking about it with a friend afterwards and we i my buddy goes wow brie larson was great in that i'm like yeah i think she was but are you sure that was brie and my friends looked at me as if i had had been drinking too much tennessee whiskey so they're like what on earth are you talking about of course, that was Brie Larson. I'm like, how do you know? And then I'm like, what? And I said, how do you know? And I said, stuff can be so deep fake right now because of AI, we're never going to be able to know if that was actually her or not. Unless we actually see footage of her on set, then that's another story. And that's what I told yeah, them. Absolutely like is. That, and I, but that's what I told them. And I said, you're never going to know. The next time you go to that movie... You're never going to know if that is Ashley Keanu Reeves or not. Yeah, it's getting very close. I I, I do uh, I was gonna add, I do video production for my day job, you know, and and I was literally on a call this afternoon where talking to a a, a generative um, AI film director who is making movies with his fingers and talking about like what scenes would be best shot with a camera and what scenes would be best created generatively. And sure. like, sure. You know, what sense. are the scenes that we can still shoot with the camera that cannot be replicated with a model? And, you know, sure. something we were talking about is like, like a person with their pet, like a human with a dog. If it was me and my dog and I'm literally just like rubbing faces with my dog and we're exchanging looks and it's like the texture of the fur and the expressions, two expressions, all that stuff. Right. He doesn't think they're there quite yet quite yet but you know it's like check back next month like he's like i'm mm, you know and then he he went and made like he went and made a shot that would have cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a, a a girl in an aquarium looking through a glass at a turtle the turtle comes to her and their eyes meet and like he made that with his hands it would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that shut down an aquarium for the day 
Sure. You know, um, I get that. Yeah. So it's nuts. It's, it's nuts. And you're absolutely right. We're getting to the point really fast where you can't tell what's fake and what's real. Um, do you think lawmakers care about that at all? Like, is that illegal? Is that a, is that a legislative issue, or is that just a? No. Yeah, I don't think they really yeah. understand that until it actually happens to them. Although they don't know it, but they get deep faked on a daily basis. I mean, just look at all the memes on Twitter of them. They're getting deep faked constantly. I think Biden was earlier this year. I think I can't remember. But I thought he I thought he was, um, or maybe it was Trump or both. But yeah, they they there's definitely been some instances of that already. Um, yeah, just the times that we live in. Um, yeah, back to, um, again, not knowing what's real or what's not. I believe that in certain, I, I think it, you know, as I, as I heard other actors explain it, it, and I hope I'm not misquoting any of them, what they have kind of said is that if it has to do with the plot, it has to do with the plot. What bothers them, and when it is what is when it doesn't deal with the plot. They're like, sure. "Whoa, is that really me, or do they, or do they fake me?" Yeah, is that my digital double? Yeah, and that's what I was trying to explain to my friend when we saw the Marvels, and I'm like, "Are you really sure that that physically is Brie Larson and not a digital double?" Yeah. And you're like, what? And we're like, it's like, crazy. I was still, is it possible? I was thinking to myself today, how long is it going to be before you can generatively uh, make like a new episode of Saturday Night Live? Probably like, not you're long. literally like, make me a SNL episode. Yeah. And it Probably creates skits. Long. It creates, does it all skits, characters, the whole thing. Probably a lot of it is crap, but you know, some of it. Might be. It wouldn't be genuine. It would be authentic. It would be. It would be completely fake, and it would it would not be anything that we fans of Saturday Night Live would appreciate, in my opinion, because we know. I really that, hope so. Yeah. You know, because because it's it's what we're used to. I can't imagine watching a fake, um, a a, a fake weekend update. No way. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, right? no way. And, total, and like the characters and skits he would come up with would be really weird and like very strange, convoluted. Yeah. So let's well, let's I can let's tell you there was there was stuff too. Speaking of that too, Rebel Moon was that way. Rebel Moon, from what I understand, was was at, was AI generated, but I forget what part. I think it was it's like the story, the script itself, or what. But but it was it was it was scripted and. I even really told some of my some of my acting friends, I'm like, boy, this out this all sounds like every movie that I've seen in the past. And like, yeah, no kidding, because it was created by AI. Yeah. At, yeah. I mean, at a certain point, if everything is a copy of something that came before, do you stop making original material? That's yeah. I think so. Right, it gets it, it. It goes like this: the amount of original material goes like this, while the amount of generative material goes like this, and then at some point you're just generating generative stuff from other generative stuff. Yeah, and you've lost all the original material. Yes. Very strange. Yeah, people should really be speaking up on this, and that's why I highly encourage everybody to. Reach out to their to their representatives on this, whether at the state level or at a congressional level. Speak up. What people forget is that is that is that politics is the nation's oldest contact sport. Sorry, football, but it's the truth. Politics is the nation's oldest contact sport, and so you should definitely, um, you know, make contacts and speak up on this issue. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, we all think about calling our congressman and that, you know, congressperson that does a lot um, and is yeah. super important. But at the state level, right, I would have to imagine like reach outreach from someone who is in the state lawmakers zip code of their district is even more important than they are yeah. in D.C. Like you can yeah. really make your voice heard at the state level. 
yeah, no, you can't. State, the state, um, although they're not in session as often as Congress, Congress works you know, throughout the year. The state's not so much. My, my state is out the door by April, um, or late April, I should say. Uh, they start out in January. They're out the door by late April. Um, so they're not in session all the time, but you can still, you know, you can still, you know, throughout the year, even when they're not in session, be educating them on this. Yeah. There, there is a, there is a, um, an actor who I've, who I've been consulting with too. He wants to bring, um, some phenomenal, uh, new legislation into the state of Tennessee next year. And I said to him the other day, I said, because he he knows our state doesn't go into session until January, and I said I should I I told and he said I should hold off. I said no, and he's like why? I said this is the perfect time to be talking to them, and he's like why? And I said because you want to educate them, you need to be educating them now, right? In a no pressure January? environment, yeah, right. Because when it comes January, it's go time, it's go time. You know things okay. going to start start to move very very quickly. On a complicated yeah. issue such as AI, you need to be educating them now. Excellent. And Maryland's the same way, January, you know, like a winter session. So I think that's yeah. really good advice is this is right now is the time to be calling your lawmakers. And, yeah. and you know, they're out in the community too. Like go yeah. see them at, at whatever they're going to go do, be the library cutting, ribbon cutting, whatever the hell, go do it. Um, and also too, quite a, few, quite a few of them are running for re-election. Not just at the congressional level, but also at the state level. In fact, we have we have an election coming up here. I think the first of August for state here in Tennessee. So, so yeah. that they're out there running right now. It's a good time to talk to them as well. Yep. All right. Let's flip quickly back up to national level. So, national GOP is put uh, destroying AI re regulation in the platform. We have not seen the the sort of uh, opposite move from the Democrats where they then take up the mantle of AI risk and AI safety. So it's almost like the worst of both worlds. You've got yeah. one side attacking our, you know, our position and the other side not even supporting it. Um, right. What are the chances that the left wakes up and takes on this thing as theirs? I think that's high. I think that's a very high. I think I, 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 I again. I think they they will, they'll come out um, strong. I think that they will. I just really hate that it's become it's all of a sudden become a partisan issue. I do too. I've been I've been because really like really have too many bipartisan issues. This is totally. a bipartisan issue, and yet we just destroyed it and made it a partisan issue in two weeks. In two weeks, correct. Because somebody shot at the former president in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. That's and a good. Re that's a good reason to change the party platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look again. Look what happened to Taylor earlier in the year. But look how the country really came together and said, you know, look, this should not happen. I mean, her army, known as Swifties, came out and said, no, this yeah. can't happen to Taylor. We demand legislation. Period. Right. Yeah. And actually, I yeah. think that helped get Elvis passed too, because yeah, Elvis was moving through the legislature at the time that that happened, and so right. I think that helped. I think that helped strengthen Elvis. I mean, Honestly. you talk about how ridiculous we are as human in numbers. So we now have less than a thousand people threatening the future existence of eight billion people. Um, you know, going right. on into the future, Taylor Swift right. is one person, one human who could probably stop those thousand herself yes yes like literally quite literally if she if she made ai risk her number one most important priority she one human could save eight billion that's not that is crazy but i don't i also think it's practically possible um is yeah, there any chance something fetched. like that it's yeah. not for fetch yes i you know that's why i was really hoping that taylor would have come out and said something to this day she has not not that i can about find. Elvis or any of it yeah correct and so had she come out and say just one sentence, that would have been the game changer. That would have been, and I still believe that's a game changer. I still believe that even that alone could get these AI bills moving in Congress. Because uh, these bills in Congress are not moving. There's bills that have been introduced in Congress last year 
that have still not been that have still not moved anyway. Um, you know, no is, it would be really good to see, but that's not moving an inch. What role does lack of understanding play in these bills being frozen? Like, is it is it they you know when you don't understand something, it's really easy to move on to the next thing. Well, so right, so up until a certain party, which I'll remain nameless, decided to make it a partisan issue. It was simply that the reason why you're seeing you are not seeing the bills move was because it would people it was not really people understood what was really trying trying to happen here. The states understood it because the states have been you know working on legislation like crazy this year, um, but Congress really wasn't up to speed on it yet. And now that you've now that this has become a partisan issue, it's made it ten times worse. Um, yeah, because there's there's there there are multiple bills that I'm tracking through Congress right now. Some of them are actually GOP bills um, that would be phenomenal to be seen, but now those bills are not moving an inch. Um, yeah. um, like there's one called the um, the No AI Fraud Act. Um, that is a beautiful bill, um, but now because a certain party came out and and said their two cents on it, that bill is not going to move. Um, there's another bill out there, a really great one. Um, called the No Fix Bill. Uh, it's it was supposed to be uh, introduced by Senator Kuhn back in June. Here it is, almost August, and it has yet to be introduced and be actually out there. There was a great hearing on that bill on April 30th of this year. It was a phenomenal hearing, one of the best hearings I've heard in a long time, uh, and yet. Um, and yet, the bill has still um, not been introduced. I had a guest on here a month or two ago um, who runs the Center for AI Security in, in France. And we were talking about the political nature of AI risk and that it hasn't become political. And his thought was actually it would be a great thing for AI risk if it became political because currently about 3% of the people on Earth care about it. And if we could make 50% of the people on earth care about it just because their team made it their issue, is that a better world? I have drawn a lot of comfort and satisfaction from the fact it has not been political. Is there any chance right. he's right? Is there any chance he's right? And that making half the people care a lot about it is better than nobody knowing about it. Well, I definitely... I don't know. I, I, I'm always come down on it's better for people to know about something than not know about it. Yep. Yep. Right. So if like, if, if the end result was this partisanship that has been injected into it, if the end result is three months from now, mm -hmm. every Democrat in America knows that AI existential risk is a huge problem. Right. I don't know. Like, is that a win? Maybe. I, I I will say this. I hesitate to say it because it's <laughs> it's 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 a phenomenal tool um, that could actually it's an it's an inside politics thing um, that can really help help this situation out. I hesitate to say it because it's a little it's 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 kind of like it's part of my repertoire but i will say i'll, I'll just go on and so say forth. what it is is a procedure within congress so right now we're seeing you're seeing bills that are not moving anywhere there's a there's a way to get those bills moving right here right now and in congress especially on the house side there is a procedure and what it does is it gets those bills like i said out of the committees and moving to the House floor almost immediately. So it's technically is called a discharge petition. So committees, again, are where good bills go to die. I always cringe when a bill goes through goes through a committee because it's never a good thing when they do. Yeah. Um, and so, and boy, was that true of Elvis. Good grief. Um, but so... Part of this charge petition under the rules, if a bill is sitting in a committee for 30 days, then it's eligible for what's called a discharge petition. 
a discharge petition uh, is where you get, I think it's either 260 or 290 uh, in the House of Representatives on the congressional side um, signatures. And you go around and get signatures on that petition to basically get those bills out of the committee. If your discharge petition is successful, it will then move to what's called the uh, Rules Committee, which will, then, which will then go schedule it for a vote uh, on the House floor of the House of Representatives. So a discharge petition is not just a congressional uh, procedure. It's also a state legislature um, procedure okay. as well, done usually okay. at that level. But that is a way to okay. get these bills. Okay. Any chance you that have- actually happens? Yeah, there's there's a good chance if we were to get, for example, if you were to get the uh, No Fakes Act to actually be introduced, um, then all you have to do is just wait 30 days, then set up a dis- then re- then what you do is you request from the sponsor a discharge petition. Okay, all right. Well, let's. Well, not with, and that's what you do in, when it comes crunch time. So discharge petitions work all the time when this country passes what's called CRs. This country doesn't pass budgets, they pass CRs. So it's called a, con- it's called a continuing resolution, which keeps the government funded. Right. And, um, when you hear Congress get into a crunch time, that's what they're doing. They're passing congressional, I'm sorry, they're, they're passing continuing resolutions instead of just passing a budget for heaven's sakes. So that's how yeah. they're able to move those bills very, very fast. They, this chart petition bypasses the committee process. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Matt, I just got a crazy breaking news bullet and you've been elected president. You're now the president of the United States. Um, what do you do about AI? I start, um, I start keeping the White House, um, uh, edu- uh, the, uh, sorry, the executive order in place. I keep that in place. I immediately assemble um, what's called an AI advisory council, which is what the state of Tennessee is in the process of doing as well. Um, to address the safety um, issues and risk involving AI. Okay. All right. So you're not like hard compute capping, uh, lining data centers with bombs, uh, that kind of level. You're 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 you you want to come in a little bit softer. If I if I'm the president, yeah. I think I'm going like hard compute cap. Get. Jensen Wong to the White House tomorrow because we're talking about putting right. tracking devices on the chips. If you don't have hardware on the chips to tell us where they are within right. three months, you're not making chips. Right. Uh, I don't know what anybody would happen, but but those two things in my head would be the two things I'd ask for, hard compute cap and then uh, hardware yeah. on the chips. Well, then I would also put in, uh, yeah, I would do that too, but in, I, 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 would, I would you know address the, um, the deep fake stuff immediately. And I would put those guardrails in place immediately. Um, and, and then is I it possible go, like a deep fake regulation could mess up frontier development? Like like that by sort of, you know, if you if you put a handcuff on their ankle about subject A, they can't run as quickly to subject B or something like that. You know what I mean? Like like if if the laws about these side issues other than X risk. Do, could they really slow down frontier development? No, I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think so. I think like all all the all the criticism over SB ten forty seven is nothing but baloney. They're 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 not interpreting the bill correctly. It's it's being blown out of proportion proportion for sure. Okay. All right. All right, let's uh, let's wrap it up by looking to the future. What does 2025 bring us from the legislatures all over the country and in well, Washington, so, obviously? Yeah, so obviously I don't think, you know, Washington's going to do much at all. I, I think because now that this is a partisan issue, I don't see them really doing much at all when it comes to this. So it'll be up to the superheroes known as the states to, to make this happen. And I, and I have full faith that the states will make this happen. The space will do the right thing, uh, and they will be coming up with some amazing legislation that will protect wow. the country. I yeah, love that really is true. Is. That is really optimistic and hopeful. And so everyone who is watching this and listening to this, 
please hear Matthew. Now is the time to reach out to your state lawmakers. Now is the time to start to educate them about these issues. Now is the time to tell them where you live and why you're concerned. Um, because that's really encouraging to think that at a state level, uh, you know, we could have the kind of impact that would really change things. That 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 is hopeful. Yeah, I think at the state level, you're more likely to have the kind of results you want um, at the state level um, compared to the congressional level. Um, I, I always believe that. I, I, and actually having worked in Congress, yeah. The states, the states have the better hand in this game, for sure, I think. Okay, so the next time you think to yourself, what can I do about AI risk? You may be thinking that to yourself right now. Here's a new idea. Reach out to your state and local lawmakers. Explain AI risk to them, who you are and your concerns. Do this today. Don't wait. Email a lawmaker's office. In California, it's a state senator behind SB 1047. Your local elected officials could become leaders in AI risk regulation in your community, but they won't do it unless their constituents, you, ask them to do it. You can make a difference today. Please take action. Next. All right, this is a little interesting. A note on how many views our videos get on YouTube. If you were to study our YouTube page, you might be a little confused at the viewing totals. You can see from our recent videos that we've been getting 20 to 40,000 views per video fed by your donations and my donations. Um, but sometimes you'll notice that either the full video, the long video, or the short trailer video will get a lot more views than the other one in a given week. And I just wanted to explain why that happens to you. So this is kind of a crazy thing. At least two to four times a month, we're making eight videos a month here. So, you know, 25 to 50% of them, the video ad campaigns are blocked shortly after they start by YouTube because they are being labeled as, quote, shocking content. <laughs> For example... Episode number 35, the first Harris Brothers shows, the full show was blocked from ads as shocking content, but the trailer that contained just literally a subset of what is in the full show was blocked. Um, so, you know, that is just pretty wild. So then when that happens, we put the campaign spend on the video that is not blocked. But last week for the first time, both of the videos were blocked, which is why the view totals are so low. They were blocked because they were labeled shocking and religious, which is apparently a doubly bad offense. I mean, come on. There is a lot of shocking content on YouTube. I really don't think this show qualifies. I think it's kind of interesting slash wild slash fucked up that these For Humanity videos are considered shocking content. Let's just say the algorithm and the company behind the algorithm for some reason just don't like these conversations we're having, maybe. I have no idea what that reason could be. Okay, friends. It is 2024, and we don't know how long we live. We don't know how long we have to live. And so we live every day like it is our last, and we end every show with a celebration of life, just something that makes us thrilled to be alive this week. A salute to Memphis, Tennessee, and its King Elvis Presley. I am not a big Elvis guy, not a huge Elvis guy, but he is a lot of fun, and my mom loves him. Um, I did once go on a tour of Graceland, his home in Memphis, and I have to tell you, it was one of my top tourist experiences of all time. Go on the Graceland tour if you ever get to Memphis. It's very intimate, very real. You are in his house, uh, and just like when he was alive, nobody gets to go upstairs, um, but it's truly one of the best tours I've ever taken. Go see Graceland. Unrelated. I am heading back to the Sphere in Las Vegas this weekend to see Dead & Company again with some of my favorite people on the planet. I am extremely excited about that. So let's bring it all together. Here is Elvis Presley in a remastered HD video performing Viva Las Vegas.
here is America's foremost waiter, but he may be tomorrow's Metro D. So let's welcome, from amongst yourselves, Lucky Jackson. <laughs> Gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on fire. Got a whole lot of money that's ready to burn, so get those stakes up higher. There's a thousand pretty women waiting out there. They're all living, the devil may care. And I am just a devil with no despair. So be my Lord, baby. That there were more than 24 hours in the day now, Even if there were 40 more I wouldn't sleep a minute away Oh, there's blackjack and poker and the roulette wheel A fortune won and lost on every deal All you need is a heart and a new steel Viva Las Vegas! Viva! Las Vegas with your neon flashing and your one-arm bandits crashing almost holds down the drain. Fever Las Vegas turning day into nighttime, turning night into daytime. If you see it once, you'll never be the same again. I'm gonna keep on the run, I'm gonna have me some fun. It cost me my very last dime. Here my wind up broke a will, I'll always remember that I had a Lady luck, please let the dice stay hot. Let me show you some of the country shots. Viva Las Vegas! Viva Las Vegas! Viva Las Vegas! Viva! Viva Las All right, my friends, please remember, AI risk is not someone else's problem. It is yours and it is mine. And in the words of the late, great Margaret Mead, never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. For Humanity, I'm John Sherman. I'll see you right back here next week.